Well, welcome everyone. Um, and a couple more will be joining probably uh, as we get into this, but uh, thanks for coming in a little bit early. Wanted to just take a moment to center, our, center ourselves and mm -hmm. to uh, pray. Um, we're really excited about the attendance that we had <clears throat> last webinar. And I think many of us, most of us here got in on the debriefing that we had, and that was, that was helpful. And uh, so here we are with round two, webinar number two. And it sounds like uh, from what we got yesterday that the registration for, for today is equally good. Of course, we'll always wait to see who actually shows up, but uh, preliminary responses look, uh, look really positive. So, um, so that's great. We'll be putting you all in uh, small groups as we go along. Kayla will be doing that. So uh, Scott and Mark, uh, Mike, Jordan, you guys will be each leading a small group. And then we've got about three others, I think, who will be leading small groups as well, or thereabouts. Is that what we're, Rhonda can't be with us today, but there's a few others that will be in leading groups. So um, yeah, let's uh, want to just take a moment to kind of quiet ourselves and, um, and then maybe what we can do is keep it open for a minute for anyone who would like to pray out. And then, um, Bina, would you like to close us when we're- Sure, I'll close us up. Uh, mm -hmm. Wrapping up, okay. Well, let's just take a moment of silence, kind of center ourselves, be glad that we're mm -hmm. here together and uh, a part of this important work that God is joining in with us as well. God, events over the last few weeks keep reminding us of just how much pain there continues to be um, around race and racism and issues of race in our country. And, uh, and they reach right into our own communities here in Central California. Um, and Lord, we know that you call us as your followers to be people of peace, reconcilers, people who represent you. Um, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to be together, to learn more deeply about uh, the history of, of race in our country and how it extends, how it extends to us uh, currently. God, give us wisdom and each person who leads small group wisdom uh, to continue to facilitate conversations to gain deeper understanding. If anyone else wants to just pray out, um, feel free over the next minute or so, and then Dina can include us. We invite your spirit to speak and to move in this time that we, we spend together. We invite you to teach us, to challenge us, to shape and mold us. Father, may we hear you clearly uh, through the materials uh, that we will go through, through the conversations that we will share. Father, it is our desire to sit at your feet, to be obedient to you as your children. Father, we pray that you would, you would use this time in a powerful way. We invite you into it. We invite your spirit to lead. All right. Since as I was watching it yesterday again and just uh, preparing for today, how uh, personal feelings, which side of the story you're on, us. Father, I recognize uh, what we will watch today uh, may bring uh, great pain for people as they look back into their own story, their own family lines and what that's caused for them. And others uh, may feel threatened by this information and the conversation. Mm -hmm. and Lord, we trust you uh, to mm -hmm. be in our story, in our collective story, this uh, 
recognize you have a story to tell us as well about who we are and our value and just uh, just doesn't match our own experience. So I pray, Father, that you would give us the imagination to uh, hear your words over us, might look at our own stories and each other's and learn to be empathetic and feel and also be ready to be transformed by the power of your spirit within us. Father, speak over us, we pray, and guide us. Mm -hmm. Lord, today we are going to hold the pain of many people. We're walking through history and begin to um, dialogue, talk about, expose, engage, educate ourselves on ways in which sin enters spaces and dismisses some and affirms others in which power can you be used both wisely and unwisely and unjustly. And Lord, I pray that as we um, enter this together on this journey, that we would be able to see and understand all the ways in which this nation was built by some and for others. Lord, I pray that your spirit would help us, your church, to awaken into understanding oppression, power, love, justice, peace, reconciliation in new ways. Walk with us. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thanks all. We'll start up here in just a few minutes. It's great to see a number of people joining us. Got some prodigal people. That's awesome. That's what I'm talking about, Darren. <laughs> Good to see you, John, or at least have you a part of it. Likewise, still got morning hair and don't care. There <laughs> uh, you go. That's what most of my students claim when they're on early morning classes. You know, the, the, I've seen the webcams go off more and more throughout the semester. <laughs> I also have a three-year-old that constantly wears princess dresses and I have to change Barbie's clothes. So that's also... I'm trying not to distract anybody. <laughs> That's awesome. If anybody can multitask, John, I think it'll be you. You could do it, man. Thanks, team. Kathy, good to see you. Kathy Wiest. Yay. Join in from Kingsburg. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I got to push all the right buttons here. <laughs> That's great. I just want to give a shout out to uh, some of my Dinuba uh, leaders that are participating. You'll see Stan over there and Joe, both from their offices. So these are local businessmen who are taking two hours out of their morning to participate with us. They serve as uh, trustees and deacons. See iPhone John. Uh, I think that's. Uh, I think that may be uh, one of our elders on here too, retired. I may be wrong, but uh, I know he's been participating and, uh, and uh, John Workington will come on too, I'm hoping. So we're having this conversation as, uh, as leaders as our, of our church too. Awesome. That's great. And we got Kansas. Kansas joining us. Yes, All right. Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's and good. I just got a text. There's a couple of folks going to be a little late. They're finishing up a meeting, so so we'll see. Excellent.
Who was that that was just previously on? Was that Gary? Gary Pre? No. Who was just talking? I think uh, I, I don't know, was I the last one to talk? Dina? Or did someone just, else? Just before that was Mark Isaac, Pastor and Mark Dynamo. Isaac. Okay. That's right. All right. That's right. Welcome to our second webinar in which we're addressing racism and a special thanks to Dina and Darren for being our leaders. Uh, I continue to discover that I'm a learner and almost every time I try to say something instructive, I discover that it's more of a learning experience than an instructing experience. Uh, Gerald Hildebrandt works for Mennonite World Conference and is headquartered in Winnipeg. Grateful to have him with us today and I'd like to ask him to lead us in a prayer of uh, opening as we begin our work this, together this morning. Thank you, Gerald. Please join me. Lord, we are privileged to come to you because you are merciful, you are just, and you are all loving. And as we gather to consider our response and our relationship with all peoples, we remember that you have come to us in Christ to redeem us and to guide us into a hopeful future. We are grateful that we may gather, even virtually, knowing that all people are created in your image that all people are drawn to you and redeemed by you in Christ, and that all people are drawn together to create a global family that is yours and that comes to you in hope and in grace. Please be with those who lead us, with Dina and Darren particularly, as they guide our conversation and our thinking. Give them wisdom in their word and also give them much joy as they share what is deep and close to their hearts. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayers through Christ our Lord, amen. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, great to have all of you with us today for this uh, time of learning. And uh, thanks to Mennonite, uh, Mennonite Brethren, U.S. for sponsoring this event. We're grateful to for their support. Uh, one of my Facebook uh, contacts said, where's the MB statement on racism? And I said, well, go to the website. That's where it is. Uh, oh, thank you, that was the reply. So uh, group, uh, glad for Mennonite Brethren U.S. taking some leadership here and uh, supporting us in this work. Darren and Dina, would you please now lead us in our morning's activity? Thank you so much for, for hosting. Great. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time, I just, again, want to welcome you. And those who are coming back will welcome as well. And why are we doing this um, four-part series webinar? And part of it is what Lynn just uh, shared with us. The statement that we put out in the USMB said that we would engage in learning. And this is what learning looks like. Learning is that we come from all parts of our spaces and denominational uh, leadership, and we do this work together. 
And Darren and I have uh, had the privilege of teaching a couple of courses over the last couple of years. And also we served at Fresno Pacific University at the, as a diversity advisory um, on the committee as leadership there. And we spent some time as a university engaging and looking at the issues of race and racism. And we used a, a tool a couple of years back that we found to be quite helpful in providing language and providing understanding. And so um, the tool is a little bit dated. It's not more the most current tool, but it has been very powerful. And so I wanna share with you, the tool here is called Race, the Power of an Illusion put together by, um, produced by California Newsreel and PBS, the Ford Foundation and others did an incredible amount of investment in this tool. And so today we are diving into the second part of a three-part series on understanding race and racism. Um, I, I want to say our time today will be, um, as we dive into this after Darren and I share a little bit, uh, we'll watch the, uh, the video together and then we'll break out into small groups and have some deep discussions. So I'm going to encourage you to find a pencil, paper somewhere and take notes because we want to reflect on this in smaller groups as we reflect and, and sharpen each other in what we heard and what we understand from what we heard. I also want to, um, to share that, that this is just part of the learning. There is many other ways that you could learn. Uh, videos, the, uh, uh, plenty of books out there, publications that have been produced, and, uh, and, and even one of the more critical ones is engaging in uh, conversations with someone from a whole different perspective in different ethnic community. And so as a faith family, this is what we wanna do. We wanna start to dive in to these pieces together. At our last webinar, um, we, we did a great, um, we presented and then small group leaders had a debriefing moment. We learned a lot about each group. And then about two weeks later, we dove into a book called The Myth of Equality. And this is this book here particularly, um, Uncovering the Roots of Injustice and Privilege. And so we are doing both the video series and the book together because the video has a bit more of the historical element, but the book here is a journey of a pastor engaging this work and understanding it and laying it to us a bit more in the terms of biblical, of a biblical view. And so in two weeks from today, we will have a discussion on the second part of the book and feel free to join us. The invitation will be sent out to you from the M USMB as well. And um, okay, so this is what we have for today. Um, Darren's going to introduce us a little bit as soon as I finish the the the, uh, the description on um, on the video number two, the episode two. So it starts like this: the story we tell. So last video or last uh, webinar, we talked about the difference between us, and it was much more scientific oriented. Um, for those of you who hadn't been in class in a science class in a while, it was a, maybe even a little bit of a of a stretch. But today is more about how we share the story and how we got to the place we are today. And so let me read to you briefly. It says, it uncovers the roots of the race concept. It includes the 19th century science that legitimized it and hold it as gained over, over our minds. In the eye-opening tale of how America needs to defend slavery in the face of radical new beliefs of freedom and equality led to a full bloom ideology of white supremacy. If you think about and hear that word white supremacy, this begins to begin to lay things out. How did that even start? Where did it start and how we built upon that piece? Noting the experiences of the Cherokee Indians, so wanted to address that this is the land even that we are in as a nation did not belong to the foreigners from Europe or, or foreigners from other spaces. It belonged to First Nations community and how they were encountered. We'll talk a little bit about that piece and the violence behind that. It also will address the US war against Mexico. And specifically for those of us on the, on the West Coast, the land in which we most likely live and worship is land also that was, that was stolen, won, whatever you want, however you identify it, but it belonged to a different group. Um, so today, the idea, and, and obviously slavery, the legitimization of slavery and the expansion of the America ideas are, is what this entire series will be about. So listen in, pay close attention, and take some good notes. And now I'll ask Darren to lead us in the next part of our today's webinar. 
Yeah, so just really briefly, like Dina uh, said, we'll, we'll start the webinar, or sorry, we'll start the video in just a moment. And if you're, if you're new to this, uh, you don't need to go anywhere. Just stay right where you're at on Zoom and uh, the video will play and you'll be able to hear it. And it'll last for about, I think, 50 or 55 minutes. And then at the end of that time, uh, we'll transition you. Again, you don't need to go anywhere. Just stick right where you're at. And uh, we'll put you into uh, small group rooms and, uh, and it'll be pretty clear what you need to punch on in order to get there. And uh, that'll, you'll, you'll stay on Zoom and you'll go into a room together with, uh, I'm not sure the number five or probably more like seven to eight or seven to 10 people. And there will be a small group leader who will then guide you all in a discussion about what you've just seen and some of your thoughts and opinions about it. Um, at 10.50, we'll give you about 45 minutes to talk, and then at 10.50, we'll come back just for a very brief wrap-up and uh, announcements about what's coming next, and we'll be done by 11 o'clock. So again, thank you for all of you who are carving out time for this. We know that this is a valuable time in the middle of a work day uh, and work week, and, uh, but we think it, hopefully it's, it's time well spent. The day, uh, like Dina said, the, the topic today is uh, the story we tell. Now, I don't know about you, I, I grew up learning more and more about my own story. Of course, I have my own personal story. And then that story is integrated into a family story. And in my case, it's also sort of this German Russian uh, Mennonite heritage story. And, and I've learned more and more about that story. And then as I was in school that intertwined with an American story as I learned history. And so I, I kind of built and placed myself within a story. But it's only been in recent years that I've realized that there's another story that I am entwined with. And that's a story around race. And, uh, and it's one that I've had to grapple with and understand. It's not always a comfortable story that I want to be a part of, and yet I can't avoid it. Uh, and so that's what today is going to be about. My, I'm gonna give you just a quick question now. Hopefully you've got your pen and paper in front of you, like Dina said, or some way to make notes. Mm -hmm. Here's your first one. I'm gonna give you one minute to journal to yourself. Uh, how long do you think the idea of race has been around? And where do you think it came from? If you really don't know, just make your best guess. I'm gonna give you one minute to journal it, give you some time of silence. And then after one minute, we're gonna go ahead and start the video. All right, how long do you think the idea of race has been around and where did it come from? Go ahead and journal to yourself. Major funding for this program provided by the Ford Foundation, a resource for innovative people and institutions worldwide. And the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding provided by these funders. created equal. All men are created equal. 
It's the lofty and revolutionary ideal at America's core. Yet it was written at a time when some inhabitants were held in bondage and others were being dispossessed of their lands. How did American society justify unequal treatment based on skin color and national origins? How did it reconcile that contradiction? America created a story, a story of race. Race was never just a matter of how you look. It's about how people assign meaning to how you look. We have the idea that it's somewhere written in stone, that there are these fundamental differences between human beings. We don't realize that race is an idea that evolves over time, that it has a history, that it is constructed by a society to further certain political and economic goals. Created over four centuries, race has become a powerful and enduring narrative. Moments in America's past reveal how this idea took hold and became the lens through which we view our world. Thomas Jefferson, a Virginia slaveholder, penned the revolutionary words proclaiming human equality in the Declaration of Independence. He also wrote a lesser known influential document, Notes on the State of Virginia. Written in response to questions from France about the American colonies, the book reads as a kind of sales pitch for America. Notes on the State of Virginia was not about race, but among Jefferson's descriptions of rivers and seaports, mountains and climate, he expressed his views on the inhabitants of the new land, people from America, Europe, and Africa. I advance it as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. It is possible to make the argument that Thomas Jefferson is the first person to truly articulate a theory of race in the United States. And in effect, he has to do so. He has said in the Declaration of Independence that we are all created equal. Well, if in fact we're all created equal, and if in fact we're entitled to our liberty, then how can he possibly own 175 slaves and going up to about 225 slaves at the peak of his slaveholding? In notes, Jefferson's words appeared to justify slavery at a time when many were admonishing the Founding Fathers for espousing freedom, while continuing to support a system of human bondage. The problem that they had to figure out is how can we promote liberty, freedom, democracy on the one hand, and a system of slavery and exploitation of peoples who are non-white on the other? And the way you do that is to say, yeah, but you know, there's something different about these people. This, this whole business of inalienable rights, uh, that's fine, but it only applies to certain people. The moment when we become a nation is critical for our understanding of both American nationality and race. We accept the notion that all men are created equal, but then perhaps some of those people who are enslaved are not quite men. That is, we'll keep our ideas of American nationality, but we'll write certain people out of the human family. The suspicions of black racial inferiority raised by Jefferson had evolved over time, shaped in part by an intense need for labor in the American colonies. In 1619, when the first Africans arrived in Virginia, 
Religion and wealth, not physical appearance, defined status. Blackness and whiteness were not yet clear categories of identity. They were more likely to distinguish between Christians and heathens than they were between uh, people of color and people who were white. They regarded uh, a person's status in life as somehow more fundamental than what color they were or what their particular background was. The different ways in which those hierarchies of social class and social power became filled in with the content of race so that the lowest class would be a black class and the highest class would be some particularly pale white class. Uh, that was a very gradual process. For the first 50 years in the American colonies, most of the laborers were European indentured servants, many toiling on tobacco plantations in wretched conditions. With fewer Europeans braving the treacherous journey across the Atlantic, planters facing a potential labor shortage turned to the transatlantic slave trade and gradually replaced indentured servants with African slaves. They found what they considered an endless labor supply. People who could be readily identified and so when they ran away they couldn't just meld into the population like Native Americans could. People who knew how to grow tobacco, people who knew how to grow rice. From their standpoint, the ideal labor source. Colony by colony, new laws made slavery permanent and inheritable for black people. And for the first time, the word white, rather than Christian or Englishman, began appearing in colonial statutes. To what extent you could say this was actually conscious strategy or what extent it was the result of a number of unthinking decisions that resulted in this, but it did buttress a kind of social structure. As African slavery increased, lower class Europeans won new rights and opportunities. Some even became overseers and bounty hunters responsible for policing the growing slave population. The ordinary white people are not going to be complicit in this system unless they get something out of it. My belief is that payoff was in a certain status, prestige, recognition, uh, ego enhancement that ordinary white people could derive from racism. And so there was a kind of bargain struck. Many of the European descended poor whites began to identify themselves, if not directly with the rich whites, certainly with being white. And here you get the emergence of this idea of a white race as a way to distinguish themselves from those dark-skinned people who they associate with perpetual slavery. Slavery became identified with Africans. Blackness and slavery went together. They gave the white American the idea that Africans were a different kind of people. There's a racial divide emerging that people begin to um, see as natural, and that's part of where the idea of race comes from, is just in, in, in the tendency for people to see existing power relationships as having some sort of natural quality to them. By the time Jefferson sat down to write notes on the state of Virginia in 1781, a plantation economy dependent on slavery was deeply entrenched. Slavery had become so widespread that to many whites it seemed the natural state for black people. But when Jefferson turned his attention to Indians in notes, what appeared natural about them was their status as a free people, brave warriors protecting their lands. This led Jefferson to suspect that Indians were not much different from Europeans. Their vivacity and activity of mind is equal to ours in the same situation. We shall probably find that they are formed in mind, as well as in body, on the same module with the Homo sapiens europaeus. The original view of the Indians was that they were naturally white people and they looked slightly brown because of exposure to the sun and because of the way they treated their skin. 
Jefferson felt that, among many people at that time, felt that the Indians were good human material, and the problem with them was not race, but culture. That the Indians were savages, but they could be civilized. Jefferson and his contemporaries were also influenced by European Enlightenment thinkers who believed that education and environment could improve people. But when Jefferson wrote about the Indians, he had little direct contact with them. Most Virginia tribes had been pushed west or killed off by war and European diseases. Those in direct conflict with the Indians those who were crossing the mountains to Kentucky or Tennessee didn't think of the Indians in an enlightenment view. They thought of Indians as savages who were trying to destroy peaceful settlers coming in and thought they should be driven out or exterminated. an ever-encroaching white population who wanted our land. As a people, we were hunters, as, you know, as anthropologists would describe us, as hunters and gatherers. We saw ourselves as equal people. We were free people. We had always been free people. Many Indians fought to maintain their freedom and land within a decade of independence. Wars with frontier tribes like the Shawnee, Miami, Kickapoo, and others threatened the stability of the young nation. The United States decided that the cheapest, easiest way to avoid an Indian war along its entire frontier and also to acquire Indian land was to, quote, civilize the Indians. Civilization included Christian religion, it included an English education, and commercial agriculture. If you can convert Indians from hunters into farmers, if you could confine them to a small acreage, then you would have all this surplus land which could be open to white settlement. The civilization policy was actually designed to assimilate us into America. It was ultimately to make us farmers uh, to live like the colonists lived. The civilization policy was to make us brown white men. In notes on the state of Virginia, Jefferson implied Indians could be assimilated into American society but he did not support assimilating black people. He wrote of deep-rooted prejudices entertained by the whites and of physical and moral differences separating the groups. Jefferson seems to have thought about it as a Virginia plantation owner who has been brought up among slaves and who, at his heart of heart, I would suppose, finds it difficult to conceive that those slaves are fully as equal. It was through those eyes that the man who wrote the nation's credo, all men are created equal, put forth as a suspicion only that the blacks are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. This difference is not simply a product of circumstance. It's not simply a product of the environment, but Jefferson broaches this possibility uh, that it is something much deeper, something innate. Uh, we would say in our own language, Jefferson didn't have this language, we would say genetic. But he says we will not be able to know this until science gives us the answers. And so he calls on science he sets American science on the path of trying to figure out what it is scientifically that makes blacks inferior to whites. And of course, if that's the question the scientist asks, then that's the question the scientist will answer. And so from that moment on, you start to build a case that is specifically geared to tell the world that these people are different. Theories of race 
are used to do that. In the next century, as the nation expanded, so would ideas about human difference. Science and slavery would help focus the nation's attention on the nature of black people. But land would propel Native Americans into the racial spotlight. A rising nation spread over a wide and fruitful land, traversing all the seas with the rich productions of their industry, advancing rapidly to destinies beyond the reach of mortal eye. The hopes expressed by Jefferson in his first inaugural address were partially realized two years later in 1803 when the United States purchased the Louisiana Territory from France, doubling the size of the country. Jefferson believed that the United States had a great future because it could expand through space, that the agrarian ideal of American independence could be maintained by expanding the country westward. Obviously, there are very big problems with this. The land was not empty. One did overrun Indians. At the time of the Louisiana Purchase, dozens of Indian tribes populated the vast new territory west of the Mississippi. And some Indian nations, like the Cherokee, still own massive tracts of land in the southeast. Indians in the south lived in the region in which wealth was very firmly grounded in land. Planters needed land on which to grow tobacco, to grow cotton, to grow other staple crops. Indians occupied that land. Indians owned that land. And consequently, uh, Indians were under constant pressure for that land. In response to this pressure and defeats on the battlefield, some tribes like the Cherokee embraced the government's civilization policy first begun in the 1790s. They would put to the test Jefferson's words. We shall all be Americans. Your blood will run in our veins and will spread with us over this great continent. Most people consider the Cherokees to be the great success story of the civilization policy. The Cherokees were able very quickly to uh, transform, at least on a superficial level, their culture. The Cherokees made many accomplishments that led their supporters to proclaim them to be civilized Indians. One of the largest tribes in America, the Cherokees had lived in small villages in parts of what is now Kentucky, Virginia, Tennessee, the Carolinas, Alabama, and Georgia. By 1819, they had signed treaties ceding over 90% of their land to the United States. With the civilization policy, many Cherokees had switched from being hunters to farmers. Some even ran plantations and owned slaves. Their children learn Christian religion and English at mission-run schools. A Cherokee alphabet was created, and in the 1820s, the Cherokee Nation began publishing a bilingual newspaper. They established a government and constitution that was patterned after the United States. The civilization policy was looked upon as a tool for survival. We began to see that that might be the only way for the Cherokee people to, to live in peace with the, the United States, not so much that we wanted to become white people. As the Cherokees became more and more prosperous along more or less classic white Southern lines, the nature of white government in America was changing. The federal government had to appeal to a much wider base of white American men than it had previously in the revolutionary period. One of the main interests of this demographic of less well-off white American men was to get land so that they could become better off white American men. 
the main result of this, uh, which was from the white point of view, an expansion of democracy and of democratic representation of inclusion of more and more people in, in American democracy. From the Indian point of view was the gradual empowerment of exactly the population which would like to take what they had. Every year, more white settlers arrived in Georgia seeking to settle on what was still Indian land. The federal government had promised to remove all Indians from the state in 1802. But 25 years later, with the Cherokees appearing even more entrenched, Georgia's legislature took action, asserting, the lands in question belong to Georgia. She must and she will have them. The state held a lottery giving whites title to Cherokee property. Whites invaded their land, they killed people, they stole their property, they forced them out of their houses. Cherokees were really being pressed from all sides, it seemed. The pressure on Cherokees and all Eastern Indians increased in 1828 when Andrew Jackson was elected president on a platform championing opportunity for the common man. Removing all Indians east of the Mississippi was central to his agenda. When Jackson, who speaks out in a kind of a populist way, speaking for the little guy, speaking out against privilege, his little guy, his citizen, is increasingly a white male citizen. As America is becoming more democratic for white males, it is becoming increasingly more race-based. It's believed that only white people can maintain the land, preserve it, uh, protect their own independence, and then using that independence have some sort of fitness for self-government that enables them to be proper citizens. Nationalism begins to be, in many respects, equated to race. People began to think that nations should be composed of people who had inherent qualities in common. They thought the same way, they believed the same things, they spoke the same language, they looked the same. And this is very contradictory to the Enlightenment notions of a united humanity. The conflict between Indian removal and America's founding ideals surfaced during bitter national debates. In a three-day speech to his fellow congressman, New Jersey Senator Frayling Heisen asked, if we abandon these aboriginal proprietors of our soil, how shall we justify it to our country? How shall we justify this trespass to ourselves? But Michigan Territory Governor Lewis Cass provided a justification, one that used race to focus on the nature of Indians rather than the morality of their removal. They have resisted every effort to ameliorate their situation. There must then be an inherent difficulty arising from the institutions, character, and condition of the Indians themselves. the Indian Removal Act passed in 1830. When some tribes, including the Cherokees, resisted removal, President Jackson's response reflected the government's shift in racial thinking about the Indians. They have neither the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, nor the desire of improvement, which are essential to any change in their condition established in the midst of another and superior race, they must necessarily yield to the force of circumstances and ere long disappear. The Cherokees felt betrayed that we were considered savages. Jackson is remembered among Cherokees uh, uh, as someone to be vilified. 
the identity of being Indian, or in this case of being Cherokee, which they had been told for decades to abandon as part of the past, as part of paganism, as, as, as a, a relic of primitive times, they were now told was inherent in them and that they should in some way embrace it. They should not become like white people. They should preserve themselves as Indians. And not only that, they should preserve themselves as Indians a very long way away. The Cherokees vigorously fought removal against relentless pressure. But finally, in 1838, the United States Army forced them to leave their homes at gunpoint. One fourth of the Cherokee nation died in camps or on the journey west that became known as the Trail of Tears. By 1840, more than 70,000 southeastern Indians had been relocated west of the Mississippi. The story of the Cherokee and their ultimate removal was also about who could be civilized and who couldn't. Who could be white, who could be a citizen of this country, and who could reside within its borders? And as the country moves west, that question gets answered in the same fashion over and over again. Eight years after the Trail of Tears, America went to war with Mexico to acquire more land. Supporters of the war argued that Mexicans were an inferior mongrel race. A popular guide for homesteaders described them as mere Indians, barbarous savages, who intend to hold this delightful region against the civilized world. When the war ended in 1848, the United States annexed one-third of Mexico's land. Most white Americans really believed the West was for them and for them alone. But this was part of a whole philosophy of manifest destiny, of what impelled westward expansion uh, throughout the middle part of the 19th century. It was this idea that the West belonged to white Americans. As they continued their expansion westward, some white Americans would use science to justify their actions and support their belief in racial superiority. In the 19th century, there were lots of public lectures on the races of man. Science was, because it was new, was something people were avidly interested in. Science in the 19th century was expected to reveal all the mysteries of the universe. You even see specific references by this period where they're saying race is the great issue of the age. The nation's interest in race was more than idle fascination. In the 1840s, the question of whether slavery would expand to newly acquired Western lands was bitterly dividing the nation and fueling attacks on slavery. There was significant momentum towards the abolition of racial slavery, but there were also very strong countervailing trends. And in the end, this created an enormous tension within white society because it was caught in this contradiction that was inescapable. As people begin to oppose slavery, the whole question of what the difference between the races is and what the status of black people should be becomes more debated. In the context of this debate over slavery versus anti-slavery, um, ideas about race really flesh out. In 1846, 5,000 people gathered in Boston to hear The Plan of Creation in the Animal Kingdom, the first American lecture by renowned Swiss naturalist Louis Agassiz. His methods valued observation over speculation. 
Agassi was quickly pulled into the scientific question of the day. Are all people, no matter their physical features, members of the same or different species? It's a debate between people who look at the book of Genesis and see what they call a single creation, God created Adam and Eve, and scientists who say, well, actually, these races couldn't possibly have come from the same place. There must be different and separate creations. Agassi arrived in America, supporting the theory that all humans were united in a single creation. But he soon began to rethink his position after meeting one of America's most distinguished scientists, Samuel Morton. A Philadelphia physician, Morton owned the world's largest collection of human skulls and had written two influential books documenting what he claimed were innate differences among humans. One focused on American Indians. The foundation work was a work called Crania Americana, in which he argued that he was using purely scientific methods to investigate the question of skull size, skull capacity, which had implications for brain size, which he thought was vital in how races progressed. Lo and behold, he discovers that white American males are the smartest people on Earth, followed in gradation by the English, the French, and then other Europeans, and then other races with blacks always on the bottom. Uh, curiously, some English scholars do the same thing. They discover English men are actually smarter than Americans, followed by French and other Europeans. And guess what? The French discover that the French are really smarter than both. Somehow, he managed to make sort of systematic errors in favor of what was the, you know, the sort of understood hierarchy of the races of the day? Samuel Morton drew wild conclusions based on very careful studying and ranking of these skulls. I don't care how many times you measure a skull or even anything physical about an individual or a group of people, you cannot predict their morality, their behavior, their achievements, potential for achievement. But that was what was important about this idea of race at the time. Southerners were actually delighted at what the scientists were doing. They were hearing from, if you like, non-special interests that there were huge differences between the races. Now, this meant that the South began to argue quite vigorously that the best scientific opinion is saying that slaves cannot exist within a free white society and that they are inferior. The ultimate defense of slavery is a racial defense. The blacks are inferior and therefore they are ready-made slaves. God created them as slaves. Why all this rant about Negro equality, asked John Campbell in his book Negromania, seeing that neither nature or nature's God ever established any such equality. Josiah Knott, a Southern doctor and disciple of Morton, firmly believed that black people were a separate species and used science to wage a vigorous defense of slavery. Though he was a good doctor, I mean, for the period, and uh, well-regarded as an expert on yellow fever, he immediately starts to show from his very first writings that when he writes about race, he throws off really any scientific uh, realism at all and writes from his prejudices. It seems so exaggerated. It looks like the publication you'd get on a sort of a dirty little leaflet that some fringe organization has published, and yet it's accepted scientific fact for a time. As these ideas took hold, pro-slavery advocates argued that the enslavement of black people did not violate the democratic spirit of America, because Jefferson's term, all men, did not scientifically include black people. In 1850, 
Louis Agassiz, by then Harvard's most prominent professor, told his fellow members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science that, viewed zoologically, the several races of men were well-marked and distinct. Josiah Knott wrote to Samuel Morton, with Agassiz in the war, the battle is ours. Here was the most objective, the pinnacle of the scientific man influenced by American racism and who transformed his deeply held belief in the unity of mankind. I think that says more than anything else that the power of the ideology of race can change people's minds. Three years later, Agassiz contributed a chapter to a forthcoming book co-authored by Knott. The 738-page Types of Mankind was greatly anticipated. It pre-sold its entire first edition. Types of Mankind was tremendously influential. It was the first time that scientists pulled together all of the research that justified the argument that African Americans, Native Americans, Asians, etc., were different species. Nations and races, like individuals, have each an especial destiny. Some are born to rule, and others to be ruled. And such has ever been the history of mankind. No two distinctly marked races can dwell together on equal terms. Types of Mankind was one of the best-selling science books of its day. Among the first to buy it were the United States Departments of State, Navy, and Treasury. Science and the politicians and popular opinion weld together in a way that is extremely useful for both. The politicians and the general population are very happy to have scientific views to lean on which say that the fact that this successful republic is not destroying Indians just for the, just for the love of it, they're not enslaving uh, blacks because they're selfish, uh, they're not overrunning Mexican lands uh, because they're avaricious for land, that this is part of some great inevitability of science, of really the way races are constituted. That is, the Caucasian race and even certain branches within the Caucasian race are superior. It's a way of sort of naturalizing a social structure which everyone understood and clearly saw that the quote unquote the Negro or in other regions of the country, the Native American or the Chinese, were at the bottom of the, the social and political hierarchy. And if you can say that they are fundamentally biologically different, then they should be. In the 1857 Dred Scott case, the Supreme Court decided that people of African ancestry, enslaved or free, could never become citizens of the United States. The opinion stated that black people had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. There's been a remarkable transformation because if you're thinking, say, 50 or 60 years before in American history, you've got Jefferson ambiguously talking about, well, he thinks possibly blacks are not quite of the same capacity as whites, but he isn't sure. But they get to the 1850s, people are writing, there are deep, irrevocable gulfs between the races. The conflict over slavery led the nation to war. After President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, his administration consulted Louis Agassiz on how to deal with the newly freed black population. 
Agassi advised, Beware of how we give to the blacks rights by virtue of which they may endanger the progress of whites. They are incapable of living on a footing of social equality. If America had just looked the world in the eye and said, we hold these people in slavery because we need their labor and we've got the power to do it. Now that would have been much better because then when the power was gone, when slavery is over, it's over. But what we said was, there's something about these people. By doing that, it means that when slavery is over, that rationalization for slavery remains. In the late 19th century, as the United States expanded beyond its continental borders, ideas of racial difference would become widely accepted at home and help define a new role for America abroad. At the turn of the century, popular culture promoted stories of race as a unifying force of national identity. Race was a common topic in the new monthly magazines. A whole new middle class readership was interested in reading about it. They had people from the House of Representatives, Supreme Court justices, experts, scientists writing in these magazines purporting their particular visions and views on the so-called race question, the Indian question, the Negro question. People consumed it without even understanding the science that went behind it, that, hey, if this expert's talking about race in the North American Review, it must be correct. Popular magazines contribute to an emerging sense of what is and what isn't American, who's white, who's not, who's better, who's worse. The unifying principle is a principle of um, white supremacy. It's a principle of shared racial identity. And if you are white, or if you can be made to identify with whiteness, you are going to be considered to be in. And that line of whiteness cuts across class lines and provides a way to unify Americans on the basis of race. All through the late 19th century, there is this constant message hammered at poor white people. You may be poor. You may have miserable lives right now, but the thing that's most important, the thing we want you to focus on, is the fact that you're white. In 1898, the United States took possession of Guam, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and the Philippines after defeating Spain in war. When McClure's magazine published the poem, The White Man's Burden, Americans seized on the phrase that embodied the country's new role as a world power. Rudyard Kipling's poem was a rallying cry for empire and a racial justification to send American troops across the Pacific to put down the Filipino rebels fighting for independence from the US. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best ye breed. Go, bind your sons to exile, to serve your captives' need, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new-caught, sullen peoples, 
half devil and half child. Kipling wrote the poem to try to encourage the United States to annex the Philippines. And clearly, it probably provided more support for the, um, those who want to take on the white man's burden, because some of the imperialists said, oh, we can bring them along, maybe not to equality, but our little brown brothers, you know, we can advance them in civilization. Even advertising took up the phrase. Pear soap claimed to be a potent factor in brightening the dark corners of the earth as civilization advances. Not all Americans supported the Philippine War, but race fueled the arguments of many anti-imperialists as well. One Southern senator declared, we of the South have borne this white man's burden of a colored race in our midst since their emancipation and before. It was a burden upon our manhood and our ideas of liberty before they were emancipated. It is still a burden. If you look at the way Filipinos are represented, they are represented not as Filipinos. Some Filipinos are portrayed as being akin to African Americans. Some are portrayed as being akin to Native Americans. Use of the imagery of African Americans and Native Americans would have been important because these were familiar peoples. Their faults were familiar to the citizens of the Republic. At the end of the 19th century, race is a kind of integrated totality. It embodied these sort of cultural, linguistic, psychological, moral, and biological characteristics into the concept itself. The concept is, is quite rich. It carries all these kinds of connotations. There's not a gap between what the regular person on the street understands about race and what scientists or anthropologists or social scientists think about race. America crushed the Filipino independence movement, and the Philippines became a U.S. territory. The United States gained a strategic port in the Pacific and began a campaign to civilize another set of natives. America entered the 20th century as the world's most prosperous nation and newest empire. In 1904, St. Louis, Missouri staged a World's Fair to showcase America's achievements and celebrate the 100th anniversary of Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase. The 1904 World's Fair was America's triumph of civilization imperialism and a new century. It was filled with hope and optimism. The organizers wanted to show America's unbridled progress. People go to have fun, to be sure, but World's Fairs are not about entertainment. They're billed as world's universities. In neoclassic palaces of progress, fairgoers wandered through technological and cultural exhibits. But on the other side of the fairgrounds, they were captivated by human exhibits, people on display in their so-called natural habitats. They would have these exhibits of little brown people to show, oh, that's a savage. Hmm, look at the way they carved that wood. And the barbarians, as you moved up the evolutionary tree. Oh, isn't that interesting? I see it's different than the savages.
Vertigo, we see an enormous number of people who perhaps they've only read about, maybe even never heard about. But here they are, living flesh and blood, there to be seen. World Fairs are very adept at organizing categories of human beings on this continuum, from savagery to civilization. One fair organizer described it as a practical illustration of the best way of bearing the white man's burden. On display for all to see were the subjugated people of America's recent past. An exhibit titled Old Plantation served up a bucolic view of slave life. And Geronimo, the legendary and recently defeated Apache warrior, signed autographs for a fee. Here you have not only American Indians put on display as a kind of vanquished people, but you also have at the fair a direct link made between manifest destiny on the home front and America's burgeoning drive to um, expand overseas. The Philippine Exposition was one of the largest and most popular exhibits created to demonstrate the benefits of America's civilizing presence. The exhibit gave Americans a chance to see the people they recently conquered. Part of the World's Fair was also about showing where you were as a white citizen. And a lot of people took pictures next to the so-called savages. And having a white body next to a dark body demonstrated how civilized they were. Nearly 20 million visitors to the fair received an object lesson that connected an understanding of race to a vision of America's future. One of the metaphors that's constantly used over and over again at the fair is the metaphor of the highway of human progress. Who's in the fast lane? Are you part of this advancing order of Caucasians? Or are you somebody else, somebody other? White people saw their advance as being historical, and this gave them an enormous motivation to see the lives of people who were not white as being outside of history and not part of this progressive advance. Most Americans believed that race was one of the most important parts of national life. That race mattered because it guaranteed this country a future in the history of the world. The United States would rise towards glory, towards history, towards its destiny. After six months, the St. Louis World's Fair closed on December 1st, 1904. Its grand exhibit halls demolished soon after. But race, a story first told to rationalize deep social divisions in a society that proclaimed its belief in equality, would be carried forward into the 20th century and beyond. We are a society based on principles literally to die for, principles that are so wonderful it brings tears to your eyes. But we're a society that so often allows itself to ignore those principles. We live in a kind of heightened state of anxiety because we know we aren't what we could be or what we say we are. Okay, that's a lot to chew on. That is a lot to chew on. We have um, asked small group leaders to um, lead discussions and conversations things like what stood out to you. And uh, we're gonna give you about 35 minutes or so 
um, to, to have a discussion. And then we want to have, hear back from you as, as groups. And so um, let's spend the next 30, 35 minutes or so. Um, Danae will go ahead and pop you guys straight into groups. Please have a um, be, participate, be attentive to this piece. This is just as important as it is watching the video to have this discussion. So um, let's have her do that now. Starting awesome. to get some people coming back now. That's yeah. Great. Um, Kayla, maybe you've done it. Did you do the kind of 60 second so the room would be closed? Yeah, I did. Great. All right. That's why we're starting to get people back. Excellent. Um, All right. Up. Welcome back, folks. There is a little feature there called reaction. So if uh, you had a good discussion, you might want to use the thumbs up or a clap on your little uh, reaction if it worked out. And if not, then we'll know your your small group leaders need some prepping up or something, sure. huh? No? Okay, it seems like we've done good. All right, we've got a couple of minutes to, to just kind of circle back and think about all that we've experienced today, all that we heard, the heaviness that this is for some folks. Yeah. Maybe in your reaction to, um, if this is the first time you're actually having conversations like this, will you put a thumbs up in your little feature there? If this is the first time you're having open conversations in a small group within the Anabaptist or Mennonite brethren space, will you put a thumbs up? Okay, I'm swatch. I'm seeing some of you. Okay. These are important conversations, absolutely. All right, I wanna open up this space, thank you. Um, for, for some of you who've been, who just maybe wanna share one or two little items. It, we only have a couple of minutes, but I just wanna open it up. We're back as the full body here. Anybody wanna share how, what did you learn today? What did you, what surprised you? And, and you can you unmute know, yourself, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, people can, you can either unmute and speak, or mm -hmm. if you want to put something in chat, um, I'll great. monitor that while Dina kind of facilitates our, our verbal mm -hmm. conversation. Yep. If you want to put in chat, perfect. If not, we want to hear for at least from two or three people. Just get a final, final uh, comments here. Well, from the video, I would say I, I, one thing I've learned is is uh, uh, that this this process is, uh, has been going on for a long time, mm -hmm. and it was uh, as it progressed across this country, uh, it was largely driven by economics and um, de developing uh, wealth and material goods at the expense of various people uh depending on what it, and uh, yeah, i think what it, what it told me is it, it's um, not a simple straight line it's a complex mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. we got to work hard at um untangling that web uh, but it's it's not going to be a easy or fast process perhaps yeah yeah all right thank you Someone else, what did you, what stuck with you? I'm, I'm just thankful that we can have this conversation. I think it, obviously it's really an important one, timely and probably quite overdue. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, very simply, just thank you, Darren and Dina, for leading us and for uh, sticking with it. And it's not easy. I know that particularly, Dina, you've had hard conversations at times. We've talked about those. And uh, yeah. I think as we go in, I begin to understand more about where those come from and why and uh, the challenge that, we, mm -hmm. that we're dealing with. So yeah, it's wow. really, it, it's great to be able to, to be in this conversation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dennis. All right, maybe one more person. 
What is sitting with you? One more person. We got a few comments in the chat as well about um, talking over this historic mentality of if you're not white, you're out and how that counters the claim of equality. And of course our Christian mm -hmm. uh, ideals and theology of, of being all made in the image of God and mm -hmm. the end vision of Revelation 7 of everybody being equal before the throne. So mm -hmm. we I think we're highlighting the, the discontinuity between the way we've acted in some of the policies and some of our ideals as Christians. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, the first comment that was named in the video was, are all men created equal? I think prior to maybe even today's video, more likely would have said, yes, of course, that's our declaration of independence. We all have rights. But now we get, begin to, to, uh, to process that a bit more and look at the ways in our history. And I think about even the Dred Scott case that was named on here. He could never become a citizen of the US, no rights. So for a season, there were ways in which folks were um, oppressed. Um, I, I, you know, a couple of big pieces to me is this idea of, you know, the types of mankind, 738 different types of mankind, or even the creation story the single creation story versus number three different types of creation stories or three different uh, couples addressing the creation story. Lynn and I were processing that. We had never heard that one prior to this video. Um, or what about the World Fair? 20 million people visiting the World Fair and on display was the different kinds of human experiences. I think about Geronimo the great leader of the First Nations community. What did that mean to him to be in that space and be on display? Wow. I was also, I'm, I'm thinking mm -hmm. about my yeah. own story and my own, my family's own story of settling in Kansas and in Oklahoma only a few years after that territory was, uh, after Native Americans were forced off of that territory. And, got a pretty good deal on, on land. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know the details of all of that, but mm -hmm. it just shows me maybe my own story isn't as distant from some of these themes as um, sometimes I, I thought it might be. Yeah. All right. I'm going to wrap up with just a, a number of us are on the West Coast and um, we worship, we live in the West Coast. And I thought about how even the idea of inferior or savages was the label that were placed upon the Mexicans. I'm Latina, born in the US. And, um, and I done a little bit of researching around even this treaty called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So let me just read to you one little phrase as we're finishing up here. The treaty, which has happened two years after the Mexican-American War came to an end, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed on February 2nd of 1848, officially ending the Mexican War by handing over California, Utah, Nevada, parts of Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Arizona to the United States. After the treaty was signed, most of the important paragraphs that did not suit the U.S. Senators were deleted without the knowledge of the Mexicans. Many Mexicans who decided to become American citizens lost their lands, their home to the homestead settlers because they didn't have the written proof of ownership now needed in the new U.S. courts. So even after we sign treaties, there's been some changes. I'm hoping that by our next um, webinar, I'm asking that we, every one of us, maybe do a little bit of research. Um, where did this land that we live in come from? I specifically want to challenge the West Coast folks to think about the first governors of California and the language that was used um, to dismiss and to um, 
disappear, the First Nations communities? What did that look like? There's a lot of good um, research now being shared now that our bit folks are more interested in knowing the, a different narrative of history in terms of this land. Um, in two weeks, again, on October 20th, we will be reviewing at the same time, the, at noon actually, um, the myth of equality. There'll be an invitation for you to join in. We're gonna reviewing part three, which is chapter five, six, seven, and eight. Nate Yoder, uh, who now works for MB Foundation, will be leading the conversation with a couple of us uh, in terms of these, these four chapters. And I'm asking that the Lord continue to stir in you. What don't I know that I should know? Where do I get my understanding and my social understanding of how things are and ought to be? And I just wanna say there's one more resource I wanna share with you. Fresno Pacific on Friday is going to invite their chapel experience will be on a book called The Brown Church. It is written by Roberto Chao Romero, Five Centuries of Latin America, Social Justice, Theology and Identity. And so um, we're finally getting scholars to do some good writing on um, a different narrative of the history of the church among different ethnic groups. There's a lot out there on African-American story, history, um, liberation theology, black liberation theology. It's time that we begin to kind of expand, like what is, what are the other brothers and sisters from the other spaces? What are they saying? What are they speaking? How, what are they preaching? And, and where, where am I needing to play a little bit closer attention to understand the fullness of God? So I'm going to ask um, that Ann Hirschberger, who is now, uh, right now, uh, interim executive director for MCC. She, at the end of this month, will become the actual executive director for MCC. She's joined us today. I'm going to ask her that she um, end in today's session with a prayer. So Ann, will you pray? Pray us out. Thank you, Dina. It is a delight to be in this gathering. Um, I, I live on the East Coast in Virginia, and uh, so I have not been in deep into uh, the Western or Midwestern uh, MB communities, although I do know the North Carolina community uh, uh, because of the East Coast uh, connection with MTC. Um, so this is a this is a delight and uh, to be able to connect with people that are interested in being the fullness of what Christ has called us to be and exploring exploring where we are and who we are, uh, no matter how, uh, how painful that journey might be, it is still a journey toward growth, um, which is where Christ calls us. So let's, let's, uh, let's pray together. Jesus, you came to show us how to live, but it takes us all our lifetimes to understand what your words mean. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. Please know our hearts that we want to follow you. We want to be a light in the world. We want to be continually redeemed, transformed into your likeness. We want to practice that, that scene from Revelation 7, uh, where, they, where the uh, writer says, after this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language, standing before the throne and the Lamb, crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Teach us this language. Teach us how to be together. Pray that you would bless this group of people as they continue on their journey along with all of us in, in being more like you. Thank you for this time to be together. Thank you for the opportunities that, uh, that digital media give us to gather in this way. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. We look forward to seeing you next month. Our conversation this month will be on racism and money, the intersectionality of these two. Don't miss it. All right. Invite others. Lord bless you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Amen. Peace.